things probably just happened, right? So one of the things could be you had this strong negative reaction and you just didn't show it. Or you had this strong negative reaction and you averted your eyes. How many of you looked away? Or you made some sense of the photos, right? So the, there are these automatic regulation processes that occur in the brain, maybe before we're even fully conscious. Things that we can make ourselves more comfortable with these kinds of images. And so my first question to Jasmine was, well, did you ask them? I did not. <laughs> It did not occur to me to ask them, and now that you talk about it, it's possible that maybe there was something going on. Maybe they were responding in such a way, but through that regulation process, I'm not seeing it. So I didn't ask them, and that makes me think of a scholar, a writer, a cultural critic named Susan Sontag. Have you heard of her? I have not, but I have now. <laughs> but I hadn't before. <laughs> so Susan Sontag writes about photography in pretty interesting ways. And there's one part in this book in particular in which she talks about the first time that she ever saw photographs of the Holocaust. Imagine, I don't know if you can remember that in your own lives. She's 12 years old, she's a little girl, it's in the 1940s. She's in a bookstore in California and she stumbles upon some images, really uh, horrible images of once after the death camps were liberated of the bodies left behind. And she talks about those images the first time she sees them as creating a kind of visual breaking point. So what does that mean? So the worldview she had, the way she understood the world before she saw those images, couldn't accommodate that kind of violence and evil and inhumanity. So she has to rethink her worldview in order to make sense, right? They're incomprehensible. She talks about them as a negative epiphany. So an example, would be this photograph from Buchenwald, and what's so disconcerting about it to me, we see the bodies of those who have been murdered, carelessly stacked like logs, and right above them, Christmas wreaths, as if there's some kind of way that you can reconcile Christ's birth, like this idea of Christianity, with this ultimate inhumanity and destruction. And I wonder, Given our saturation with images, do we still, are we still able to have a visual breaking point? And I think it's these kinds of questions that bridge our disciplines. I'm interested in emotional experience. I'm interested in how people regulate that. But it would not have occurred to me to ask about how we experience history, right? But once that comes onto the table, I think, well, we can use the scientific method to really get at what the interaction is between people's emotions, history, and the things they bring to the table, right? The individual factors, whether or not they perhaps identify with either the victims or the perpetrators or onlookers in the pictures. And so we had this great idea to then do this project. So the main question we start with is, are we emotionally connected to history and can we use images, historical photographs, to get at this question? So I'm interested, of course, in what <coughs> the subject's response would be to photographs of Abu Ghraib. And those examples of those, um, these photographs are made by the soldiers who are committing the acts of torture. They could be part of the torture it itself, but they're also, they act, they function as souvenirs, right? Souvenirs of these despicable acts of torture. And if we wanna go back historically a little bit farther, we can see other examples that we might link to this kind of practice. In particular, I'm thinking of photographs of lynchings in the United States around um, 1900, a little before, a little bit after. And in the same way, these are socially condoned within this network, um, murders, acts of victimization and torture and death. And they're created in a, in a shared social space in which photographers, studio photographers, would go and take photographs of these events and create souvenirs, trophies almost, that they would sell to the crowds. These were spectacles that you would bring your family to. You see the little girl on the left-hand side, smiling, crossing her hands? She's not an exception. This is a relatively common kind of image. And I, I think we like to think that this is distant historically, that this, the, the, the ethical, moral, social world that makes this possible is separate from where we are now. But when you think about the Abu Ghraib photographs, that distance starts to collapse. And in my lab, so we, we wanted to answer the question, are these images powerful? 
And to do that, we did a number of things. I first want to say, though, for my lab, it was kind of difficult to do this work. We usually use standardized sets, which I'll talk about in a second. But we, you know, it shakes your humanity when you realize that these things have happened not just once, but at different time points throughout history. It sort of leaves you a little bit saddened. Um, the girl in the picture is probably the creepiest picture for all of us. Like in our lab, we voted that she is the creepiest, and that is the creepiest picture. So what we did is we took sets of these images, we showed them to a sample of Marquette University students, and we just asked them to rate their emotion before and after they saw the images. To be sure that this wasn't just about violence, we took a set of standardized photos, and these are not those, these are similar to the ones we used. And we wanted to be sure that we had this set, and researchers have horrified and disgusted and made hundreds of participants feel really uncomfortable with these sets of images. So we know they work. And so... <laughs> it's the control group. It's the control group. Right. So what we wanted to do is compare how people rated their emotions to these historical images of violence and torture to these other sets that presumably don't have that same context but are equally disturbing and make you feel uncomfortable. So we do the study, the preliminary study. What do we find out? And really, so again, the start of this is we want to know more, but we had to find out if the images work. And what we found, and it restores my faith in humanity to some extent, we found that participants are angrier to all images of violence, right? So to our control group, that standardized set, and to the Abu Ghraib and lynching photos, they report feeling angrier. But what's interesting is they're even angrier when they see the lynching in the Abu Ghraib photos. They're angry when they see violence, and they're even angrier when they see lynching in Abu Ghraib. One sort of caveat to that, and Jasmine wondered aloud whether our inundation with violent media sort of changes where our breaking point is, and I would say maybe. So we asked participants to rate how much they enjoyed engaging in um, first-person shooter video games, how much they enjoyed violent movies, how much they enjoyed violent TV. And the more that they liked it, the less angry they were. It's not that they didn't get angry at all, but they were less angry the more that they enjoyed engaging in those kinds of activities. So there may be something. It might change those people's breaking point. The other thing, is that the government might be right. No. <laughs> <laughs> when participants viewed the Abu Ghraib and the lynching photos only, so this didn't happen in relation to that standardized violence set, they reported being less patriotic. They felt less patriotic when they saw these images. And so I know Jasmine doesn't want to hear that. Well, I, I <laughs> just don't believe in freedom too. of the press, but <laughs> that's a different topic. And then finally, there is something about what we bring to the table. So to the lynching photos only, individuals who identified as white said that they, they rated themselves as feeling guiltier when they viewed that set of images only. And then we also found that people who said they hadn't seen these images, and a little bit surprising to me, but consistent with what Jasmine found in her class, is about half of our population had not known that these images existed. They didn't know they were out there. And for the people who didn't know the lynching photos existed, they rated themselves as being more detached from those photos. They weren't connected mm. to that. So maybe my students weren't so atypical. So when I look at those photographs, I think of them and I see them very specifically and very historically. They may have seen them more like just generalized violence. It's possible. And it's too early to tell and answer that specific question. But I think what these data do tell us is that there is some power in a historical context, that there's something about feeling history specifically that people are more emotional than just the violence, and that we may have visual breaking points. So we do feel history. There's still a possibility for visual breaking points. And this is important, because visual breaking points show our empathy. Right? It's what makes us human. And if you think about the way that you all learned history, I'm going to guess, in middle school, in high school, maybe elementary school, you're reading out of a textbook, perhaps, right? And you're focused so much on events, on names, places, and dates. You're focused on knowing history. 
but not on feeling history, as if there's some kind of mutually exclusive relationship between objectivity, which is how we're trained to look at the past as historians, and emotion or feeling about the past, when maybe we need to teach our kids more how to feel history and not just know history. And in the affective neuroscience world, we know that you need emotions. We know that emotions tell you what's important. So if we want to know what's important, we need to feel it too. Thank you. Thank you.